Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center and our series of briefings today throughout the day on Discovery's uh, final voyage. This one, of course, to the International Space Station, the 39th mission of Discovery. Uh, our first briefing is a program overview. Joining us for this first briefing is John Shannon. He is the uh, Space Shuttle Program Manager. And also joining us is Dan Hartman. He is the manager for ISS Operations and Integration. He also chairs the uh, station's mission management team twice a week, so he stays fully abreast of everything that's going on with all of the international partners around the, uh, around the world. So we'll hear from both gentlemen, and then we'll throw it open for questions. And with that, I'll start with John. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Well, it's, uh, it's good to see everybody again. It's been a while since I've been here to... Uh, to give you an update on the program status, we've been very busy since our last launch. Uh, concerning the STS-133, uh, we had a good program review about two weeks ago. We have had a very smooth flow on this vehicle and the stack uh, since STS-131. Um, the program, we really had no issues that we were going to carry forward to the agency flight readiness review on uh, Monday. and. Um, uh, more a status of just how things have been going uh, in the program and the processing of this vehicle. Uh, we did have one problem that uh, started last week with the, it's been pretty heavily reported with the uh, one of the fuel lines with monomethyl hydrazine in it that we use for the uh, thrusters and the, uh, the uh, orbital maneuvering system engines. And uh, we had a small leak in, uh, in the plumbing at a flange fitting and uh, the team has been working that very hard over the last week. Uh, you probably have heard that we did some, some troubleshooting on it. It looked like the, uh, the leak stopped. Um, but the team, you know, the, the tenet that we have is that we fly with accepted risk. We, we don't fly with unknown risk. And uh, I characterize this as an unknown risk case because we didn't understand why we had that small leak. And so the team is working very hard right now to uh, to set up all of the uh, equipment to drain the tanks. They'll do a, uh, in what they call educting, basically take it uh, uh, to dry the system, take it down and, uh, and do a vacuum on it, uh, get it all safe, and then we'll break that flange open and, um, and look at the, the metal ceiling surfaces, look at the two uh, ceiling rings. They're like O-rings, they're metal covered with Teflon that are inside there. And we'll understand the situation, and I fully believe the team will uh, will get that back together this weekend, and we'll be in uh, in good shape to go fly. So that's really the only uh, the only systems issue that we had uh, for uh, discovery and in, in preparing for this flight. You know, just a few things about it uh, since this is a program status. Uh, it's it's pretty exciting that uh, Discovery is going to take up the last major United States module to the station. Dan will talk about that some more. Plus, getting. ELC-4 up. I think we're, we're uh, making good on our promise that uh, we would get the space station in the absolute best possible config we could with spares and, and equipment uh, before we retire the space shuttle. Uh, when we came out of the, um, the uh, flight readiness review, we set the launch date as November 1st at uh, 4.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The window for, uh, for this flight uh, stretches from November 1st through November 7th. Uh, the mission is 11 days, and then we have one extra day that we can add. We'll have the consumables we predict to add a 12th day. Uh, if we launch at the end of the window on November 7th, we would not have that additional day option. Uh, we, would, uh, we would run into some, some issues. So if we launch between November 1st and November 6th, we, we would have the potential of adding a 12th day. If we launch on the 7th, we would only have 11 days, but uh, the full mission could be completed in that, uh, in that time frame. The, uh, the range is pretty clear for that, uh, that time. There was a Delta launch in there. It's moved out to uh, November 15th, which is after landing for us, so that helps us out quite a bit. There's a, a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch currently on the 8th. It is not an issue for us from the range because uh, we use one of the solid rocket booster recovery ships to go get the Falcon 9 first stage. And uh, what we understand SpaceX would do is, is slip day for day with us to, uh, to allow us to have that uh, SRB ship on station to, uh, to recover their stage. So if we go on the second, they go on the ninth, and, and so on. If uh, for some reason we have some kind of an issue and we don't go uh, between November 1st and 7th, the next window opens 
Uh, right now it's December 1st through the 5th. It may end up being extended a couple more days, the 1st through the 7th, depending on what happens with 25 Soyuz, and, and uh, Dan can, uh, can talk about that some more. It's an interesting flight. Besides the, uh, the activities we're going to be doing at the International Space Station, we'll again be doing our boundary layer transition DTO. This is the types of things that, uh, that we think we should have been doing on the, on the space shuttle throughout the program, treating it as a flight test vehicle. Uh, that's the small bump on the, uh, the underside of the, uh, the left wing that uh, will trip the boundary layer and get some additional heating in one of our uh, uh, high tile thickness areas. Uh, we've got thermocouples under there to understand that. We'll image it from the ground and, and from, uh, from infrared cameras that are flying. Uh, I was privileged to go to an AIAA concert, uh, conference about, yeah, they have very few concerts, uh, about uh, five months ago, and there were 11 papers on just the science that they've gotten back from the, uh, the boundary layer tripping. So it's, a, it's an environment that uh, it's very difficult to collect data in. I think that data will be very useful to, uh, to a variety of vehicles that, are, that will be designed in the future. You know, we have, a, uh, a, uh, we have had a mantra throughout the program that, you know, we're not, even though the program is ending, we're not going to stop trying to improve the vehicles. And uh, we're going to try and make the very last flight the very best flight. And we're going to, as we learn things each flight, we're going to include that into the processing and make it better and better. Uh, for this flight, we have a, a full ceramic plug redesign on a number of different areas where you take tiles off to get it, it uh, equipment underneath. Uh, you have tiles that you put a, a bolt through to attach it to the structure. And we have these ceramic plugs we put in, in those bolt holes. We lost a couple of them a few flights ago. Uh, Discovery is flying with a with a redesigned plug that uh, it actually flew on the last flight as well, and it uh, showed excellent performance. And we didn't would, did not lose any ceramic plugs. We have uh, some thicker, tougher tiles. They're called Brie tiles, and uh, we added 24. I'm sorry, we added 33 new Brie tiles to the underside of Discovery on this flow. And uh, there were 24 of them were on the forward edge of the ET door. So we put the tougher tiles along the brakes and the fuselage where if you had some kind of tile damage, you could potentially have, have a significant damage to the structure of the vehicle. Uh, so we put those Brie tiles in there. It's a total of uh, 213 on Discovery, and uh, we're in very good shape to, uh, uh, in case we get any kind of foam or ice or anything else, that uh, that Brie tile has a significant layer of protection to us. We also worked on the uh, rudder speed brake tiles. We lost half of a tile uh, during ascent uh, two flights ago, and um, we did a lot of rework on shimming those tiles and, and making sure that they were in, in good shape. We repaired some cracks. So, you know, we have not just been kind of sitting back saying, oh, Discovery's going to fly one more time. Uh, we don't need to, uh, to do any upgrades. We don't need to do any, any uh, enhancements on it. That is not the attitude the team has taken. They are uh, working just like they always have to, uh, to try to make it the best vehicle they possibly can before we go uh, commit to flight. I am sure I will be asked about workforce. Um, we went through a significant downsizing in uh, right before October 1st of this year. Uh, we're basically half the size, the program overall is half the size it was two and a half years ago. And uh, from a prime contractor standpoint, the shuttle program currently has 6,439 prime contractors. We were at uh, just over 14,000 in uh, in 07. From a uh, civil servant standpoint, we have 1,139 civil servants that support the program, and uh, we were at about 1,800, so it's a little more than 600 civil servants that, uh, that have gone off the program in the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, we expect that uh, we'll have one more uh, reduction in the, uh, in the team members on the primary contractors. In January, it will be about 320 people. And uh, then we'll hold where we are from a workforce standpoint because we'll be down to really just operations team and critical sustaining engineering skills. At that point, if we end in uh, after the February flight, then the, uh, the final layoffs would be in March, would take us down to about 300 people total to do transition and retirement activities. Uh, if we fly in the summer, then roughly a month after that last flight, uh, we would do the same thing, and we would uh, we would reduce at that time. 
Um, I would just, uh, you know, it, I would end by saying that uh, I'm really proud of the teams um, that are working on these vehicles with the obvious distractions that we have with, uh, with budget uh, discussions and, and transition activities. Um, it's a very proud group and that really shows in the focus that they put into reconfiguring these vehicles and getting ready for flight and just a tremendous amount of pride that they have in the, uh, in the successful, uh, successful missions that we've been flying over the last several years. Um, and we're prepared to, uh, to send Discovery out on a, uh, on a very high note. That's all. Dan. All right, thank you, John. Uh, well, we certainly look forward to the, to the ULF-5 mission. Uh, as, as John mentioned, it'll be our final module that we bring up to the International Space Station, our permanent uh, multi-purpose module. Uh, it's Leonardo FM-1, commonly called the MPLM. Uh, we've upgraded it and uh, have it ready for uh, its uh, long duration stay on, on station. Uh, and also ELC-4, and I'll talk a little bit more on the, what we plan to do with that. Uh, that'll be the third of our four EV, uh, ELCs uh, that we'll be delivering. We have one more uh, coming up with AMS on uh, ULF-6. Uh, the PMM will del be delivering 6,500 pounds of cargo. Uh, we have another 1,500 pounds in the mid-deck, uh, ranging from ORUs to consumables to uh, actually 3,300 pounds of uh, research uh, on this mission, which is a, a very big gain for us. Uh, the research guys will be flying their their last express rack, express rack number eight, and uh, that, that, that rack in and of itself can handle and accommodate uh, 10 payloads. Um, we'll be moving the PMM to the Nader, Node 1 Nader port, and the port's been checked out and it's ready to go. Uh, so we feel like we're in good shape there. A little bit more work to do, but uh, every, all indications is we're just fine. Some of the major spares we'll be flying up on, on this mission um, that'll be in the PMM is uh, a spare distillation assembly that is for our urine processor. Uh, we currently don't have a spare on board, and so we're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll supply that. Uh, we have three more in the pipeline to come up uh, as we need them. Um, uh, but that's a, that's one of our critical ORUs we'll be getting up. There's a spare CAT reactor, which is kind of the heart of our water processor assembly. Um, it'll be coming up. Uh, a Cedra bed. Uh, we're continuing to. We have a couple more beds to change out on our Cedra. Uh, we have two integrated racks of Cedra presently, uh, one, in, one that operates in the U.S. lab, one that operates in Node 3. Uh, we'll be actually doing some work on the Cedra during this mission uh, of, and with the intent of it bringing home one of the beds so we can retrofit that and get an upgrade on that. And we also have a spare treadmill coming up on, the, on this mission. So that's some of the major cargoes. Uh, once we get the PMM on board, uh, it'll be used uh, primarily to help us with our overall stowage uh, and logistics uh, concerns that we've had. Uh, as you know, we've been just stuffing these flights completely full. Uh, we tend to overflow ourselves on, on the allowable stowage locations, so we've been making do. Uh, we're actually going to spend some dedicated time later this year to uh, really try to go get our pantry set up, our stowage integration efforts uh, in line to, to, to make it more efficient for the crews to, to, to get to certain pieces of hardware. As far as the ELC, Four, it'll be going to uh, the S3 truss, uh, lower, lower inboard. Um, basically, it's only flying up with one ORU. It is the uh, one of our, our radiators, one of our prime radiators of our six that we have. It'll be our only spare up on board. Uh, and on the bottom side of the of the ELC, we have uh, five what we call FRAM adapters. Uh, no ORUs are flying up on the on those specific locations. Two of the ORUs that are coming up on HTV2. Uh, the FHRC, which is uh, a part of our thermal control system as well, and uh, a box that we call the uh, cargo transfer container. And inside that, it contains uh, 12 of our remote power control modules, our power distribution boxes that go outside. And so we'll be, and when we get to the uh, to HTV2, we'll actually have Dexter be taking those off of the pallet that comes up with HTV2 and transferring those over to the to the ELC. Be two EVAs uh, on this flight uh, with the primary duties of preparing and uh, getting the external pump off of the MSS. Uh, that's the pump that we had fail uh, on the segment uh, um, about uh, three, four months ago. Uh, three EVAs to fix it. We ran out of time to relocate that thing back to ESP2, so we'll be doing that on EVA1. And then on EVA2, we'll actually vent the remaining ammonia uh, out of that pump module. Um, 
all kinds of water transfer, uh, nitrogen transfer, oxygen transfer. The, the, the shuttle will be able to top off our, our airlock tanks. Again, we, we kind of ran those down about 75 pounds for the, for the EVAs that we conducted uh, for the pump module, so we'll be able to top those off. So uh, we're looking forward to that. As far as the, the onboard systems uh, on station, uh, we're ready to go. We're ready to support uh, our consumables are in, are in very good condition uh, to support, uh, support this mission. Uh, as far as uh, kind of recent activities on board the station, uh, over the last week or so, we have been installing uh, the Sabadier system uh, into the OGA rack, or oxygen generation rack, and actually went to, uh, first time we tried to activate it was last night. Uh, we, uh, we, we actually did generate water uh, from, from our Sabadier system, so that is a major accomplishment. Uh, went to processing mode probably around uh, 8 o'clock last night. Uh, we subsequently had a, a shutdown that, uh, that I think the teams well have, have well understood, and uh, they're probably in, in the control center now bringing that system back up to, up to speed. So the Sabadier is uh, kind of the, the last leg of our regen system. It's taken the uh, carbon dioxide from the, from the Cedra scrubbers. It's taken some hydrogen from the, uh, from the OGA uh, system, combines those, and we produce water, and then vent uh, the gases overboard what we don't use. When up and fully operational, it'll, it'll generate about two liters per day for us. I mentioned Dexter. Uh, we did do a checkout of Dexter with, uh, with an RPCM uh, several months back. Uh, we got into a kind of a high uh, friction force uh, in pulling one of our RPCMs out. Uh, and so we stood down on, on Dexter activity during that time period. Although I would say during that time period, uh, Dexter performed just fine. We just didn't have it configured right with the arms of how to pull that ORU out with the loads that we were seeing. But as far as overall arm performance, controllability, everything associated with Dexter worked just fine. So now we're getting ready to go do the HTV uh, checkout task uh, with Dexter. It'll be, uh, I think, around December. I think we're 12-6 and 12-7. We'll get Dexter back up in operation. And we'll be going to, uh, to, the, to the frams that we're going to bring up on this mission uh, to, to manipulate them around to get more comfortable, uh, get more runtime on Dexter uh, for the mission that comes up when we do this uh, for real on HTV2. Um, science continues on board the International Space Station. Um, we're, we're still somewhere around 25, 30 hours a week. Uh, we've actually had some major rack moves uh, this week. Uh, within the within the complex, we've uh, we've relocated, or today we will relocate the uh, microgravity science glove box out of the Columbus module and put it in the lab. Room was freed up in the lab once we moved all of our regen racks over to Node 3, and uh, we also moved a, a Melfi rack uh, earlier in the week as well. As far as our upcoming vehicle traffic, um, we have a 37P undock on Monday. Uh, in fact, we had the go/no go. It's probably going on right now in our IMMT. Uh, we have a 40p launch on 1027 with a docking on 1030. The Russians have moved their EVA 26, their stage EVA 26, a couple days. That'll now be on 1115. They were talking about back to back, uh, or close within a week, of uh, EVAs 26 and 27 occurring within a week. Uh, they have since uh, slipped out EVA 27. Uh, they need to get some additional cargo up on 40p to support that EVA, and so we'll we'll go figure out where we're going to go put uh, EVA, Russian EVA 27 in the in the timeline. But uh, they're targeting sometime in the January time period. Uh, with that, uh, um, and the primary task of EVA 26 is to to bring inside a couple payloads that they have out there. 23S landing is still scheduled for 11:29. Uh, and that gets us to the next Soyuz launch, and I think most know about the, uh, the transportation issue that they had uh, on transporting it down to Baikonur. Um, they have since changed out um, the descent module uh, of, the, of the Soyuz. Uh, they flew one in from, uh, from Moscow. It, it arrived. They have already taken the old descent module out. They've integrated the new descent module in, uh, so integrated testing and, and uh, uh, hookups, uh, everything they do for, for pre-launch checkouts are going 24-7. Uh, they have indicated to us, though, that it will cause a two-day uh, two slip in their launch. And so we're probably going from 1113 uh, to 1115. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we, kind of, we are staying very, very busy on board the station. And uh, I'd just like to say on, on November 2nd, uh, we hit our 10-year human presence 
uh, on board the International Space Station. So quite a milestone for us. And with that, uh, that's all I got. Go. Okay, thanks. We'll take questions here and then check the other NASA centers, KSC and headquarters. And Jeremiah, since you're on that side, we'll work that side and then come over here and we'll start, start in the back there with Mark. Uh, thanks, Mark Corot for Aviation Week. And I uh, had two questions, one for uh, John Shannon. You mentioned um, sort of a floor on personnel around 300 at the end of the program. And I, I wonder, I think you're talking contractors on the numbers you gave us other than when you designated civil service. But when you get to 300, will they be in charge of uh, preparing the orbiters for, for uh, museum duty, so to speak, or is there another activity? Yeah, it, it's uh, it's hard to put one number on it, Mark, because it's a sliding kind of kind of scale. There will be a significant layoff after our last mission, and the vehicle is uh, is what we call down mission process, basically safe. Uh, then we'll have the significant layoff. We'll have uh, we have identified the personnel that will need to stay around to do things like safing hazardous systems, getting pyrotechnics out. Uh, and actually, all across, uh, there's uh, shuttle equipment <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and uh, at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, at Stennis, out in California, uh, here at JSC, uh, it will it will take a small group of people to go through and prepare them to be uh, dispositioned in, in whatever way they may be. So, um, and, and that 300 people is kind of the beginning number, and I would expect in a year it would probably be about half that. And, uh, and then a year after that, probably half that again. So uh, it's a big job to get through all of the, uh, all of the uh, hardware and, and uh, facility structures that we have. But uh, we've had some time to get the plan together, and I think it's a pretty solid plan. Uh, thank you. I had a question for uh, Dan Hartman, too. You mentioned uh, the descent module change out. And um, I hope I didn't read too much into this, but you mentioned that it was flown in and I just wonder if that's going to be like a permanent change in procedure since there were some questions about whether it was damaged by rail shipment. Uh, and they, 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 they have not told us uh, if there's a generic change. I, I, I would almost be convinced they're, they're doing this because of the urgency of the schedule that they're trying to meet. And, and they had it there. They can get it there into the, into the airport, into Baikonur. And then they just trucked it over to their, to their, to their facility. Uh, I have no indication that this will be a, a generic change for them. I know they're very. They were, you know, obviously they're. They have the commission out looking into the overall transportation efforts on on how it goes from Moscow down to the, down to Baikonur. Robert. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com, uh, with two questions. First, for John, um, you talked about the improvements made to Discovery and the continual improvements made to the fleet. Um, but given this is the last flight of Discovery, how? If you can, if you can um, approximate how much of the of discovery is as it was the day oh. it launched uh, 26 years ago versus, I mean, is it is it mostly a would you call it mostly a new vehicle versus mostly an original vehicle? How would you describe the condition of discovery? Thinking, um, the structure obviously is uh, is is unchanged from when it uh, rolled out of California, out of uh, Palmdale. Um, the TPS obviously, you know, is is mostly the same, uh, other than any damage that might have happened and has been repaired. Um, payload bay is basically the same. In the cockpit, though, of course, we did the uh, the cockpit upgrade with the uh, MEDS system, which is our glass cockpit, which was a significant upgrade to the uh, to the vehicle. But uh, for the most part, it's it's as it rolled out of uh, of Palmdale, and uh, and uh, we've just done some. Uh, some uh, safety and, and uh, usability improvements, but uh, not that different. Probably the same as any uh, 25, 30 year old airplane, right? And for Dan, um, you mentioned the, the upcoming 10th anniversary of, of human presence on the space station. Can you give it a, a, a report card um, how uh, the space station has performed expectations um, fully crewed for 10 years? Um, well, I'll be biased. I'll give it an A, right? We've, uh, yeah, we, 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 we've struggled uh, at times. Uh, you know, we early systems, uh, you know, we had some early MDM problems. We had some early CMG problems. Uh, um, the Russian side, you know, with the, with the Electron and Vosduk, um, once we got up the, kind of the redundancy built into the system, it just made it that much more robust, and, and we feel like we can rely on each other 
to get us through any kind of down times and, and we have those kind of discussions all the time at the IMT. I mean, it's almost on a daily basis where we talk about, uh, hey, I need to do some maintenance on my system. Make sure you have enough spares on your side to go, you know, pick up pick up the slack. And that's that's just kind of routine business. So, um, you know, overall performance. Uh, you know, during the, after the Columbia accident, we went down to a crew of two. That was a, a very challenging period on the vehicle um, to to maintain it and sustain it. But uh, once we picked up assembly. Um, you know, we had a computer glitch, we had a torn solar array, uh, but, but then you're in, in a, into kind of the more nuisance, stuck bolts and latches won't come free and just got to go out there and, and, and deal with it uh, real time. Uh, it, I'm extremely proud of the team. It's just a, a major, amazing accomplishment to uh, take it from, from, you know, from a, from a node and an FGB to the, to the structure that we see today and, and then uh, have the, the presence on there for 10 years. And, uh, now finally, I shouldn't say finally, we've been doing it for, for the last uh, year or so, but really picking up on the research. And so we're committed to the, to the, to the upmass that the research community needs. Uh, they basically have a free reign of all the, all the upmass that they can, they can muster up right now. Um, we're always working on efficiencies and ways to improve the crew time for them. And uh, to date, they've, they've, they've come through. They've, uh, they've had to wait for us a little bit, but uh, they're over 600 uh, strong in the in the number of experiments accomplished on space station. Bill Harwood, uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. A couple of questions. Uh, first, for John, if the sealing uh, the seal re R and R does not solve your problem for whatever reason, um, is there any scenario where you can change out that flange and still make the December window, or or would something beyond replacing the seal push you in the next year? I don't know, uh, Bill. We haven't uh, run it out that far. Um, I fully expect that they'll. Uh, They'll demate the flange, take a look at the metal surface polish if needed, put the seals in, and it'll work just fine. Um, uh, if there's some other problem or significant flange damage, or if we don't, uh, uh, if we damage it somehow in trying to repair it, then we would lay that schedule out, but we have not done that work yet. Um, and for Dan, we were talking before this started about Soyuz entry issues with the, the pressurization system. Could you go over that again? And given the descent module issue for the flight coming up and a few other little issues they've had, I mean, I don't know that any of these are major in and of themselves, but are there any concerns of uh, workmanship or anything else as the Russians accelerate their flight rate to support ISS as it is today? Uh, I mean, that, that certainly comes to mind, although I, I think, you know, in, in, you know, for the last... Uh, Typically, for the events that are over there, you know, you know we're involved in, uh, we're, we're on the ground there, so we're we're, we're listening in here and, and we're discussing some of the, some of the issues that they've had. Um, as far as the uh, the O2 system and the leak that they had uh, on the last mission coming home, it actually occurred just a few minutes before the undocking, um, and uh, the pressure did go up. Uh, the PPO2 did go up. It did not violate any of their requirements. Um, as they went through descent before they uh, dropped off the, the HAB module, um, they did offload a little bit of pressure to the HAB module, um, which I think is, is kind of almost a standard practice for them if they get into this scenario. The crew was trained to do it. Um, and then they had a, a nominal reentry. Uh, I will also tell you that on the last Soyuz that went up, uh, they also had an O2 regulator issue that they are trying to piece these two together and see if there's just some sort of manufacturing uh, this lot uh, is of any kind of particular concern. Um, and so they're, they're working through that now. The, the, they have that commission up and running as well. Um, they have early indications to me are, are they're looking at some, some seals associated with a valve, um, but they will report out to us. Uh, they report out to us at, a, at our readiness reviews. Uh, they have their own general design review, much like we have uh, our FRRs over there. Uh, that go through all their anomalies, that go through all their open paper, a very, very similar process to what we do. And, and typically, uh, we're in attendance on those. Um, but for the O2, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're troubleshooting it. Um, we actually took, uh, there's a common regulator with the progresses as well, uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, since we have 37 P's getting ready to leave. Uh, we've, we've brought all the excess O2 into, you know, basically into the stack uh, to, re, to, to help us out metabolically. Uh, and then they have since taken out that regulator as well. And so they're just trying to get more assets and what's going on. And they will 
they have uh, told us they'll do it, or they're doing a thorough inspection of the regulator uh, in this area for the for the 25S launch. Gina? Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Uh, thanks for answering the workforce question, John. I can uh, ask something else now. Um, the uh, uh, there's still some uncertainty about the summer flight. Obviously, you guys have to be working on that if you're going to go fly in in June or July. Um, sort of in, in terms of your own work group, sort of what is your confidence that that mission is actually going to happen now? And talk a little bit about the challenges of preparing for that mission, but still not sort of having the authorization to go and do it. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I would first say, you know, what you're talking about is the summer flight, uh, which is right now our rescue vehicle flight, um, 335. And the discussion is still ongoing, but we have to point out how important that flight is to the International Space Station. And, um, you know, there, I think Dan can tell you, you know, in great detail, from a logistics standpoint, I think that... Uh, 2012 is going to be a real challenge for them. And if uh, there are delays in any of the new vehicles that are expected to deliver cargo to the station, that problem is just going to be exacerbated. Um, and I, I asked my guys, it's hard to figure out to compare vehicles and, and um, uh, capabilities, but my, my operations guy said one shuttle flight is roughly equivalent to about seven progress flights. Does that sound about right? Um, so if you think about that, I mean that's that's an amazing. You can get pretty well on one shuttle, and uh, so so getting to fly 135 late is going to give the space station margin from a logistics standpoint to keep six crew up, to keep doing the research, to keep doing the utilization, uh, even if some of those new vehicles are delayed by some period of time. Um, you know, when, when the uh, authorization bill was passed, some people questioned our plan to continue with the workforce downsizing uh, as much as we, uh, we have. Um, and that was a very difficult decision, but what we have, the plan we have put in place allows us to carry through enough money to be able to keep the program going uh, and make the decision on whether we fly 135 as late as possible. Um, we really can't make that decision under a continuing resolution. We need an appropriations. And uh, I'm not sure when that is going to show up, but if it shows up even as late as February or March, we can keep the program intact to preserve the option to fly 135 in the summertime. Uh, the downside to all that, or, or the, the thing to really think about, is, is the people. Um, I had said before that if we launch our last flight in February, that we're going to have a big layoff in the middle of March. And uh, by law, you have to provide a 60-day notice to those folks that, uh, that they're going to get laid off. And um, that would end up being sometime around the middle of January that those notices would go out. Um, what I would like to avoid to stop the stir in the workforce is sending out the layoff notices for March and then turning around two months later and saying, you know, hey, just just kidding, we're going to actually go until, you know, the summertime. And uh, that's not, in my opinion, very fair for this team. What I think we have done is we have let the team know that that is a possibility. And uh, I've gotten nothing but uh, but understanding uh, from the folks, they understand exactly where we are in the uh, in the authorization appropriation cycle. Um, the team has to prepare Atlantis for flight. We have a uh, a good plan to uh, take up logistics, even if we flew it as a rescue mission. So there's very little difference between what a 335 rescue flight would look like and a 135 mission would look like. Um, so there's really no difference in our preparation. There's, uh, there's sufficient funding to carry out the decision until uh, very close to, to February, March, when we would fly 134. Um, we're just trying to, uh, to optimize it to not perturb the team with, uh, with layoff notices. So I think the whole team understands the shuttle program is coming to an end. Uh, they need to get on with planning their lives, what they're going to do post-shuttle, uh, whether stay in the space community, go to, go to other industries. 
and um, and we need to allow them the time to do that. Um, and that uncertainty makes that difficult. So the sooner we know, the better. But uh, but the process we're in is is pretty well understood. I would point out that you know it's it's probably a good um, a good discussion point to make. We. Uh, we are doing a lot of workforce surveys, a lot of things to kind of gauge the um, the uh, focus and attention of the uh, of the team. Make sure that we're going to fly these very safely. Um, we're also working very hard to have job fairs and workforce transition for the contractor teams uh, to uh, allow them to to find new jobs. And I've spent a lot of time with the uh, with the um, companies that come to the job fairs and. Uh, uh, the common comment uh, from just about everybody I talk to that is a recruiter is that this is not your typical workforce. The uh, engineers that have come in into the contractors or you know to work for NASA directly, they were the best of the best coming out of school, and they have this experience of working in an operational space program. The uh, technicians that have come in work in a safety culture that is unlike any other out there, and they work to, to incredibly fine tolerances and do amazing work. Um, so I think there has been some more comfort in the workforce that there is a lot of uh, new work out there. In Florida, it's not in Florida. It, it seems to be outside of the state. Uh, in Texas, it seems to be within this area. Um, so the folks that are staying with the program are just kind of savoring the adventure. And uh, looking forward, after we we finish this uh, uh, this outfitting of the station and retire the shuttle safely, that uh, that they'll get on with the next thing, whether they stay in the space community or whether they go and, and improve the um, uh, the companies in aviation or electronics or IT or oil and gas or wherever they go. And I was it was related to me, you know, the the story of the Avro era, which folks ought to know if you know your space history, that uh, when that program was canceled in Canada in 1959, uh, the probably biggest beneficiary of that cancellation was the Space Task Group at Langley, which eventually came to uh, to uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center, which is now the Johnson Spacecraft Center, to, to execute the Apollo program. And some of the, the very highest leaders of that program came from the cancellation of that Avro Aero program up in Canada. And I see the same thing happening here. Um, as we release this incredibly talented shuttle workforce that has this background in uh, operational spacecraft, it's going to benefit commercial spacecraft companies, it's going to benefit aviation companies, it's going to benefit electronics companies. Uh, I think across the entire spectrum of industry that uh, folks are going to go out and, uh, and benefit from it. And uh, this workforce is, is greatly desired. They are, they are finding finding jobs and uh, even in this ex incredibly difficult economy. So I would just say this is not your typical workforce that we're trying to place. Anything else, Eric? Um, I just, you know, maybe to follow up a little bit, what kind of confidence do you, are you working with, uh, at least in your own mind or within your within your top program people, that, that the flight is actually going to happen as a logistics mission to the space station? 80, 90 percent yeah, sure it's going to happen? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I, I have nothing that's that's swinging me one way or the other. I told my team it was 50-50. They'd be prepared to fly uh, 335, and uh, and that will prepare us to fly 135 if it, if it becomes uh, an uh, an option. <coughs> Mark. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Airspace News. A couple questions. Um, first one would be for John. Um, can you relate how you're going to approach discovery post-landing? Um, do you need to keep it in a certain configuration to, to give you flexibility with dealing with the next two flights, or is there a certain point where it officially becomes unflight-worthy as a vehicle again? And then I have a follow-up. Yeah, that's good, Mark. Um, uh, that's been a debate within the program, is do you keep discovery in some kind of a flight-ready state uh, to provide uh, spares or, or <coughs> provide options? I am. I'm not in favor of that, that option. Um, although we haven't completely decided it as a program, um, my opinion is that, that we need to get on with business, that we need to, uh, uh, once discovery is, uh, is at wheel stop, that we can immediately start to reconfigure the vehicle as a display. Um, we have, uh, we are in the middle of a very 
significant effort to identify hardware off of discovery and also in the spares that could be used for some future as yet unknown program um, or that we would want to maintain as spares for Endeavor and Atlantis. Um, we're also going to pull some off as uh, engineering teaching units so that uh, future generations uh, will be able to take the hardware that was flown on the shuttle and, and dissect it and, and understand the, the engineering and, and how, it was, uh, how it was put together. We're also going to go in and look at some hardware on Discovery that has flown for 30 years that we've never looked at before. Uh, things like uh, actuators and, and some structural areas that are impossible to get to. And uh, those will be fairly invasive. Uh, it'll take time and it'll take money, but I think that's one of the legacies the shuttle can provide is for a real reusable spacecraft uh, over a number of flight cycles, what is the real condition of the hardware? Um, so really four areas that, uh, that we'll be looking at with Discovery is, um, is hardware that could be used for future programs, hardware that we would want to have as spares for Endeavour and Atlantis till the end of the program, uh, engineering test or education kind of units, and um, and uh, uh, the last one is is hardware we would want to take off and either do destructive testing or some kind of significant NDE to understand its state. So even after Discovery lands, it will not be we will not be finished learning about the space environment. We will even learn from from the uh, uh, from the vehicle post post all of its missions. Um, so I that's my goal is to, to start immediately on that. Um, it also, because we're in a constra uh, constrained fiscal environment, uh, it allows me to get that work done and then get that workforce off the books. And, uh, and that's another, uh, you know, we're having to make tough decisions right now, very difficult decisions as we move forward um, and anywhere we can, uh, can save money and, and get on with business, that's, uh, that's where, where we're headed. And, um, um, just to follow up on that, uh, you said the debate's still ongoing. Uh, do you have a, a, a date when you have to kind of commit to one path or the other, uh, since we're only about a month away, I guess, from wheel stop? Yeah, it's a... Uh, sure, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to break, break in the next question. Go ahead. The, uh, the study is not finished yet as to what hardware we want to pull off, uh, and the, uh, the total cost is not totally assessed yet. Um, where I am leaning is to, to get on with business. And we know immediately post-mission, the down-mission processing will give us some extra time to make that decision. So it's probably about a, a month after landing, we, we have to have the plan in place. So we still have a little bit of time. And then um, the, the last question for John, uh, you mentioned the, the uh, boundary layer DTOs. It was such a big deal when you have uh, gap fillers, protrusions, and so forth. I was just wondering, because I have seen no data from the so far, have you learned whether you're, you, you were maybe too conservative, maybe that thermal environment was more benign than you thought, or is it worse? What, what have you learned from that so far? Well, and the reason we went and got the gap filler right was there were such big uncertainties in our, uh, in our analysis capability, right? You, and that stemmed from two things. One is you didn't know how this flexible gap filler would bend over or, or fold, uh, so actually what the height would be. And then you didn't, we had a, a very large error band around when we would trip the uh, laminar uh, flow into a turbulent flow and get the increased mixing and heating. Um, so what we did is is now we can control the protuberance height exactly and we have thermocouples in the back that show exactly when you trip and exactly what the temperatures are. And what it has shown is that we trip later than our worst case and the temperatures are significantly lower than our worst case. Um, so our models have been updated and I actually haven't asked that. If we went back and looked at the gap filler on uh, was it 114 when Steve Robinson pulled it out, right? If we would have made that same decision given our updated models, I am pretty sure that we would not have done that. But, you know, at the time, you don't know that. And, and, and you take the best analysis that you can. Um, I think it's great that, you know, the team picked a, uh, to keep the aerodynamic surface on the underside of the vehicle, um, tiles are different thicknesses, and so they picked a very uh, robust, high, uh, factor of safety tile area and uh, put these thermocouples in and put the uh, put the uh, the protuberance in which you know a lot of people were a little nervous about right because we're trying to protect the underside of the vehicle as much as we possibly can but people said hey you know we need to uh, we need to understand this for future vehicles um, we're also putting a catalytic coating on some tiles um, that are 
uh, downstream from that protuberance, and that catalytic coating is what is proposed for the back shell of the Orion. So as you have that, that uh, very turbulent weight coming off of your heat shield and hitting the, the back shell of Orion, you know, is the coating that you're going to put on there going to be sufficient? Well, hey, we have a great arc jet in the, in the returning shuttle. We'll put the, the, the uh, coating on those tiles downstream from it. You'll get that mixing at Mach 18. You'll get that higher temperature. You can see how that coating does. And you can also see how the difference in that thermocouple under that coating changes from the thermocouple in an uncoated tile next to it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great experiment, and, and the team has done a great job pulling it off. And, and I, boy, shame on us if we haven't gotten the results out there uh, so that everybody can see them, because it's it's some pretty impressive work that uh, that has been done. Go ahead. So Philip Sloss with NASASpaceflight.com. I'm not sure if this is for John or Dan or maybe, um, but uh, I understand there's an, uh, a fourth EVA is being added to the ULF-6 SDS-134 mission. Um, can you uh, talk about what's going to uh, what's going to be added in that fourth EVA? Not off the top of my head. A question for Dan. Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you, I, and it's, it's true, we have recently added to the fourth and I'm just uh, drawing a blank on, that's pretty far out in the future there for me when I'm a, almost a real-time guy, so well, I'll, well, we can get that for you, sorry about that. I was going PRCB today, so, you know, oh, is it? you have good sources. So you haven't approved it yet? I have not approved it. Okay, that. sorry. <laughs> get Leroy over here. Okay. Anything else? Any, any other questions over here? Let's come back, Mark. I, I want to go around to the other NASA centers first, and then we'll catch whatever we can back here. Uh, let's head to the Kennedy Space Center, the launch site, for some questions. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press with a question for Mr. Hartman. Um, the contractors, some of the contractors here are talking about if that 135 flight is approved, uh, the word on the street is that perhaps the space station program would like it as late as possible perhaps fall of 11, maybe even November. Um, is any serious thought being given to, if it's approved, um, pushing that flight out a lot beyond June, July? Uh, Marsha, not, not that I'm aware of. In, in the, probably some of the discussion goes, are there any critical ORUs that we would like to get up on that 135 that we have in the production flow right now we haven't really gone through and looked at all the details of where those might end up and how much risk uh, we would think it, if we accelerated a lot of those developments, uh, would we be there on time and give us a little bit of margin. So that would be the only discussion uh, that I know of that would be pushing around uh, June, July. Certainly that's what we have been uh, thinking and talking about within the program. But we are looking at, uh, at our critical ORUs list uh, and if that list happens to pile up, uh, if we get this extra flight, I'm sure that might be a discussion point that we have with, uh, uh, that Seth will have with, uh, with John and Gerst and, and the folks. Um, thank you. And, and you have a seventh crew member on board that you haven't mentioned yet, uh, Mr. Hartman. Um, R2, could you just sort of talk about uh, the big picture? I know there are briefings later today on that, but what do you see um, this robot bringing to the space station program and beyond? The seventh member here pretty soon, not quite yet. Uh, uh, proof, of, proof of concept, demonstration uh, is what it's going to, uh, you know, is, is what it's all going to be about. Uh, you know, the, the concept is we're going to be operating from the ground. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start slow, build up some tasks to, to see how uh, useful and uh, how much, uh, you know, IVA crew time we can get uh, some efficiencies out of. Uh, but I imagine it, uh, it'll be a technology demonstration for the first year or so, just to, to prove the concept out. And like you said, there's, there's many more people behind me that can, uh, can talk really a lot about that. But uh, it's going to be exciting to, to have Robonaut up there. Hi, it's James Dean from Florida today with a few questions for John and one for Dan if there's time. Uh, John, first, uh, if the flyout continues on schedule, can you say at this point, exactly how much a 135 flight would cost and how would it be funded? Uh, what we asked uh, the, uh, the uh, Congress for in the appropriations was uh, $600 million extra to extend the program out through the uh, really the July timeframe. And uh, that is still, 
uh, still the figure that uh, that uh, we have put out there. Um, you know, we'll see. It's a little bit to Marsh's question as well. Um, if we had uh, the additional six hundred million dollars, and uh, with the amount of money that we've been able to save through making some of these tough decisions over the last year. Um, I have asked the question, this is probably coming from me, I have asked the question, how late could we fly the uh, 135 mission? And uh, S Mr. Suffordini and I talk about it a lot. And, uh, and, and the, it's a very simple premise, right, is that if you're doing this to, to, to uh, add additional logistics to, to give you some margin for when your next vehicles are going to come up, um, it would make sense that the later is the better, and uh, and so we've had you know just initial discussions on uh, from a budgetary standpoint without really looking at at uh, the real logistic schedule or when ORUs are available mm -hmm. or range or any of the other constraints that we have for actually launching the vehicle. Um, how late could we go just from a budget standpoint? And uh, I I can't uh, understate uh, I can't overstate how much it will benefit the space station to have an additional flight in that time frame. And, you know, to me, if we don't fly 135 and the, the uh, new vehicles that are going to deliver cargo are delayed and we end up having a logistic shortfall in 2012 and we have to go down to three crew and we're not doing research we have made a major error, in my opinion. Um, thank you. Um, just uh, given the, the recent layoffs that you've discussed, I wondered if, if you could say if this upcoming launch represents one of the most challenging that, that you'll have uh, overseen, or is that how much of a factor is that heading into, uh, you know, your November 1 launch? Um, Obviously, momentum overall building toward the end of the program as well, and just just wondering, you know, is is that making this a different experience for you, or is it just like any other launch that you're getting ready for? I am uh, I'm ready to launch. We've uh, had this gap while we waited for things to show up to uh, to go fly, and uh, the team gets a huge lift uh, from from having a launch, and um, you know we'll see small issues uh, surface in the program and. And uh, we always kind of say a launch fixes everything because it's such a morale builder and the team works together so well uh, in executing a mission. Um, we've been very, very careful in the workforce reductions that we have made to maintain critical skills. Most of the workforce reductions are in the production side. Uh, the operations team is fairly intact. Our sustaining engineering team for all of the elements is intact. Uh, we have good what we call bench strength. Um, I will tell you also that I have been getting a lot of scrutiny from uh, people above me and other organizations that provide oversight to NASA about how are you maintaining safety? How do you know that you have safety in the program? And, uh, and we're spending a lot of time working on that. We had an independent study done by uh, Brian O'Connor in his uh, Office of Safety and Mission Assurance. And you know this is nothing that you want to just sit back and 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 uh, and uh, accept. You want to keep pushing on it. But I'll, I'll I'll read you the results. Was that the government mandatory inspection points the GMIPS that we do to inspect to make sure that the the hardware is received in the uh, proper uh, configuration. That uh, our rejection rates are at historic lows and very stable. That uh, our material review boards, which disposition hardware that is maybe not per print. Um, our rejection rates are still showing a downward trend, so we're not having as, as much uh, MRB activity. Um, process nonconformances have been in a downward trend for the last three years. They're continuing that. Process escapes that uh, we, we document, and, and we bring in quarterly all process escapes in the program, even if it was just to one project, and make sure that we transfer those lessons learned across all the projects um, they're at a, a historic low. Our work authorization documents, technical error rate, basically the instructions that the technicians use to put the vehicles together. Um, 
we have a four-year error rate that uh, is continuing to decline, and uh, the overall rate is uh, is stable below one error per thousand pages, which was our which was our goal. Uh, and in-flight anomalies, which uh, we since return to flight, we classify, I think, everything as an anomaly. Uh, we, we don't have any of these, well, it didn't work quite right, but we're not going to call it anomaly games. We don't, we don't do that. Um, the last three missions have been below our 12 mission average. Um, now, it's, it's, uh, it's, so I look at this report and I think, okay, um, how do we keep doing this? And the other question I ask is, okay, do we have less people reporting things? And that's why our numbers are going down. Um, and so we've done studies on the on the human side and uh, to make sure that the reporting um, process is is the same as it has been, and that we're getting equivalent data from previous flights. Uh, one of the reasons it's lower is we're not in production anymore. Um, but most of these things are after things are produced and they arrive at Kennedy Space Center for integration. So overall, the program is very healthy, but I have a very high sense of paranoia um, that this is a very difficult time for the team and we need to be incredibly vigilant. And um, any little noises that you hear, uh, you have to go pay attention to and really uh, make sure that you fully understand uh, what is going on and, uh, because it's a very complex process and very unforgiving. And uh, so far the team has been doing an outstanding job and we're going to continue to to stay focused and the team really wants to preserve the legacy of the shuttle program and, uh, and end on a, on a really high note. Uh, thank you very much. And la uh, wrapping up for me, uh, John, I wondered if you could just reflect a bit on Discovery's career and you know what, it, what you think it's going to be like to, uh, to retire this, this fleet leader. And, and also for Dan, I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the, the point John's been making about the, the logistic ch log logistics challenges ahead. Um, when, when do things start to get dicey for you if you don't have a commercial resupply mission? Yeah, I, you know, so I, my rearview mirror is, is, uh, is kind of turned down until we finish the program. Um, Discovery obviously is a, is a special vehicle as all of them have been. Uh, being the, the vehicle that put Hubble up, that uh, was the return to flight vehicle twice. You, you might even say it was the return to flight vehicle three times because we flew it on STS 121 after we, we uh, went down after 114. Um, it's, a, it's an outstanding uh, vehicle. You know, we've learned a lot from operating Discovery. We, we've learned a lot from operating the space shuttles. Uh, I, am, I am greatly looking forward to using that experience and uh, in taking the next step. And um, uh, I think that across the shuttle team, now that acceptance has kind of taken hold that, uh, hey, the program is going to end, we're going to end it right. Uh, we're going to get station configured exactly the way we want it to be. Uh, and then we're going to take this expertise, and we're going to move on to the next uh, to the next step, and uh, and everybody's really looking forward to that adventure. Let's see, and on the on the when the the vehicles co are coming in, and where we might have a pinch point, it's it's at the tail end of eleven uh, and twelve, uh, as John kind of alluded to earlier, and so when you get into this discussion on on uh, one thirty five, three thirty five. Uh, we've had discussions internal to our program um, that we want to load enough consumables on that flight to, pretend, to potentially go for a year, so let's say food and you know, those type of consumables. So obviously we would have a lot of that already on board. And so we've, you know, Mike has kind of challenged the team. It's like, hey, what is it really going to take uh, if we can load that, uh, that MPLM up with, uh, with a year's worth of supplies for, for the crew? Um, and we would probably do that at uh, potentially at some expense of some some less critical ORU. So, so that's you know that kind of shows us that uh, we're, we're we're concerned about it. Obviously, a lot of these CRS vehicles are are you know there's demonstration flights that still need to happen, and then CRS needs to pick up and go. Uh, you know they're on the books. Uh, we, we need them, and we, you know we 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 are very hopeful that they'll be uh, be successful in getting there on time. Uh, but it is. Uh, there is risk. There is development out there that still is is uh, has to be put behind them, and uh, it's just uh, prudent for us to take to take a look at uh, the what ifs and the contingencies. And so, so that's what we're looking at as well. 
And then the other part of, of the 135 flight is, uh, you know, we can get some critical ORUs home, and, and it's this tear down and, and understanding some of our failures. Uh, you know, we're, we have the pump module that we're preparing, uh, like I said, on the, on this these EVAs to, to bring that home potentially on, on that flight. So uh, that'd just be a, a great source of information to try to further understand the root cause of, of why that pump went down. Hey, it's uh, Bobby Block from the Orlando Sentinel with a few questions for John. First is, um, could you tell us a little bit about how um, the flow is going uh, for uh, 134? There's a few rumors around that there's some payload issues again and there might be a delay. And linked to that, I was wondering about when you were talking about earlier about looking at the idea of possibly when you're when you're talking to Mike Suffredini about pushing things back, I mean, what what would be the latest time that you would contemplate a uh, pushing 135 out? Uh, Bobby, hey, on 134, I I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about uh, delaying it uh, one day to February 27th, um, but that was not not an issue with payloads at all. So, so ATV backup docking capability or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I haven't heard of any payload issues either from AMS, ELCs. So if you, if you have a more specific, um, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, as far as how far could we push back uh, June flight, it all depends on money. And uh, we'll see. Um, I don't have my, uh, my actual costs from October since we're first, this is the first, <laughs> we're still in October. And uh, I'll have those in December time frame, and I'll understand better uh, the impacts of the, uh, the layoffs that we did. And um, as we go through, if we see uh, what the appropriations numbers are uh, and we work with, uh, with headquarters on, uh, on the money, then that will define how far out we can, uh, can stretch this program. We are at about, our target was about $125 million a month. And uh, we're under that to about 100 and, uh, $112 million a month is what it looks like. So, you know, every month that goes by, we're, we're buying back a little bit. Now, you know, it's, it, we can also use that money for other things. And uh, that will be the discussion on the, uh, on the priorities. Does it make sense to, uh, to delay a little bit to put ISS in better shape? Or do we want to take that money, uh, lay off the workforce, and go, go step out into the next, uh, the next activities that we're going to do? So it's a... Uh, it's going to be a, a lot of discussions between now and uh, and uh, the summer if uh, if we're going to fly 135 exactly where we go fly it. And uh, one final follow up, which is looking uh, very much to the future. I know a lot of your team were was involved in looking at um, possible designs from where do we go after the shuttle program. And I was just wanting, since there's so much talk about a, a, a shuttle-derived vehicle following on, uh, do you think that uh, it's possible that uh, we are, it's, it, you're going to make a uh, NASA can make a 2016 deadline to uh, for the next vehicle, or do you think that that's it's far too early to say? Well, it, you know, again, it's going to depend. Uh, that's our. I think that's going to be our direction if the uh, the appropriations follows the authorization, and uh, I know NASA will uh, will uh, pull out all the stops to get there. And uh, I, as far as designs on uh, HLLV, the, the Marshall Space Flight Center has been doing a, a great job here of, uh, of coming up with different designs and, and a schedule and cost are, I think, their, their, uh, their, their biggest uh, concerns and, uh, and they'll, uh, they'll keep working through that. So, uh, you know, if it's our direction, we're going to work towards that and, uh, and I think the team is certainly capable of doing that, but we'll... Uh, We'll see what the final language says. Okay, up to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. for a couple of questions, please. Hi, this is Denise Chow with Space.com. Uh, just a really quick question for John and then a question for Dan as well. Um, about the seals on Discovery's fuel lines, I just wanted to confirm that the repairs can be done um, safely and effectively with Discovery on the launch pad and what the potential risks are involved with that. Um, we will make sure that we do them safely. Uh, the plan on the launch pad is, uh, I think, is a good one. Uh, we're going to drain all of the hydrazine out of the tanks. We're going to, uh, to e-duct them. We're basically going to, going to pull a vacuum on them and dry them out uh, before they break it. But they will still be in, in scape suits, the, the full enclosed suits. 
in the uh, actually in there's some puts and takes we talked a lot about do we want to do this fix horizontal in the OPF or do we want to do it vertical on the pad and it, it was kind of 50-50 the, the access to some things is better in the vertical the access to the other things is better in the horizontal and uh, uh, the team feels very confident that they can uh, they can safely accomplish it uh, the the access you know it's, it's uh, I relate everything to working on a car, right? But it's kind of like working on your car. It's it's uh, three inches, you know, on the backside to get to get uh, uh, to the bolts and, and separate the system, and then they'll look at the at the ceiling surface and polish. But uh, I think they have a they have a really good plan. I you know, the cape and the techs that work on the vehicles they're they're miracle workers, and you know, to me, I always. Uh, I, I think they can do everything, and I always side on the fact that hey, we're going to go put the vehicle in the best possible config, you know, prior to launch. And I, I need to knock wood here because you know some of my some of my peers said, well, what, what if we mess up the flange more and trying to repair it? I don't I don't even consider that. You know, the guys just do an unbelievable professional job. And if we did have something happen on it, then they'll fix that too. So I, you know, we'll get it in the right configuration before we go launch and understand exactly what we have. And uh, and we'll do it safely. And if it takes more time, it takes more time. And that's uh, that's the way we've been approaching things here the last couple of years. Thank you. Um, and just a question for Dan now. Um, you mentioned the 10th anniversary of um, Expedition One arriving at the ISS and the start of the continuous crew habitation. Um, what's the significance of that 10-year milestone, not only for our country space program, but um, international cooperation, and uh, what does it mean for the future of the ISS? Yeah, and, and you've, I think you hit it. The international cooperation aspect is, is kind of what I hold my hat on. It's it's just, uh, you know, we, we had to do it with, uh, with other countries. Um, it's just been an amazing feat to, to be able to get there. Uh, you know, exposure to long duration, understanding, the, you know, the, the our, our regenerative ecosystem is just going to be completely, you know, transportable into any other kind of uh, vehicle we, we, we develop for, for long-term exploration. It, it's going to be critical to that. All the medical research, all the human research that we're doing to understand uh, the effects on the human body, uh, in my mind, uh, just directly applicable. So. Um, as we go forward, uh, you know, we're making plans to, to 2020 uh, with, uh, with understanding our, our capability out to the 2028 time period. So uh, we're hoping we can keep this thing going. Okay, we're back here for a couple of wrap-ups. We'll get Mark and then Bill. Uh, thanks again, Mark Corot from the uh, Aviation Week, and it's for uh, Dan Hartman. I think you mentioned on the on the descent and the last uh, launch, the descent module had a O2 pressure rise. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if in each instance that was in spec and why that is a concern that you really need to chase down. And again, I, I, we'll have to get with the Nergi to get the more details. Their commission is still ongoing. So just kind of uh, anything I say is kind of what I have heard and, and I'll, I'll wait for that, that kind of official. Um, obviously, if you have an O2 leak, um, it was past a regulator and I believe they were manipulating a valve and so uh, potentially a seal on a valve uh, may have uh, came loose or, or, or got got uh, misguided and then realigned itself after they manipulated a couple other times. Um, total pressure, I think they were starting to get concerned and that's why they vented it off into the HAB module. The, what the, you, where you can get into trouble is in a PPO2, a partial pressure of, of oxygen, total oxygen concentration into the cabin. Uh, that's where the, you, you have some pretty strict flight rules and ground rules and uh, to my knowledge, uh, on ne either case uh, were those violated. You have one last one right up here. I have a question for John that I doubt there's an answer to, but knowing John, he's certainly thought about it, and I'm curious about it. If, if, and I don't even like to mention aborts, but if you, if you, uh, if you had an RTLS on 133 or 134, it, it, would you have a chance to fly that flight again with the current budget environment, or would an RTLS end that mission? I'm assuming a tower would end it for sure, just because of the time it'd take to get an orbiter back, but. I was just curious where, how aborts could be handled from a budget standpoint with these final three missions. Thanks. I, yeah, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I, it, again, we, we would weigh what caused the abort uh, versus how important it is to, to supply ISS. 
and um, uh, you know, it, the the problem with an abort ride is I have a very limited set of flight hardware, right? And I would expend one, and so that would take the 135 off the table, and then that would change the crew size for 134 because it'd be a Soyuz rescue, and on and on and on. Um, so it, it it depends. It totally depends on what caused the abort. Uh, uh, and, and then you would decide whether it was safe and appropriate to fly the next mission. Okay, well that's all the time we have for this briefing, but stay tuned. Uh, coming up at the bottom of the hour is the mission overview. You'll hear all the details from the two lead flight directors, Brian Lunny, for the uh, space shuttle portion of STS-133, and Royce Renfrew, who is the lead flight director for the station side of the uh, ULF, the Utilization and Logistics Flight 5 part of this mission. So stay tuned for that at the bottom of the hour. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Thanks, everybody.